Uh, the title of today's message is Continued Prayer. Continued Prayer. This is Children of Babylon, Part 8. So, we're going to surmise the rest of Daniel. That's not really easy to do because a lot happens from the lion's den till the end of the book of Daniel. A whole lot of things that I'm not willing to try to address in this chapel. One, because I would put you to sleep. Um, there are so many theories on the end times and what Daniel is saying in these last few uh, chapters. He, there's a, there is a number of visions and prophecies in which have been used throughout the centuries to talk about end time events. So, what I am going to tell you are those prophecies that have been fulfilled. And I'm going to do it really, really quickly just to surmise um, those things that I do understand. Obviously, um, I discussed this last time, eschatology, the study of end time events, is not my strong suit. And I would dare to say it's not anybody's strong suit. When you're talking about things that will be, when you're talking about the Jewish people who had memorized entire books of the Bible yet they didn't recognize the coming of the Messiah. How many books of the Bible do you have memorized? So, when it comes to end-time events, I'll, I'll say like the Jewish people say about the Messiah, and if Jesus is the Messiah, we'll see. We'll see if your eschatology is right in the end. Now, it's fun to speculate and to have conversations about end-time events, and but... If that's what you're majoring on, then you need to refocus. If the first book you want to read when you come back to, to Sunrise is the book of Revelation and the end of Daniel, you might want to jump to the book of John where it talks about Jesus, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the one who preaches love and compassion and repentance. Um, and so I'm not going to go into the depth of what we think the end time will look like there are some beautiful things there, and I think we can make some specula spec speculations and some hypotheses you know, that are educated guesses to the end times. But I'm not going to do that. What I will do is tell you what Daniel does prophesy that comes true after his prophecies. So much so that secular scholars would say that the book of Daniel was written after these prophecies came to fulfillment. Because they would say they're too accurate. They're too accurate for them possibly to have been written before um, they came to pass. But I beg to differ. Daniel prophesies of the end of the Persian Empire and the coming kings in secession that would come um, in the Persian Empire. He then goes into the rise of the Greek Empire, even talking about Alexander the Great, not talking about him by name, but very meticulously talking about this, this ruler who would then spread, apart, uh, spread out across the world and then saying that after his kingdom or his death that there would be four kingdoms spread out and he calls it the four winds to the four winds of the earth. He's talking about four um, kings, his four generals that were underneath Alexander the Great. Read the book of the end of Daniel and you'll see some of these beautiful prophecies fulfilled in history when you understand history. And so we see the prophecy of the Greek empire rising, of Alexander spread throughout the land of the Bible, of these four generals, Ptolemy, Seleucius, Cassander, and Antigonus. These are the four winds. These are the four kings that are spread out on the four winds. So they... There is no king or no ruler like Alexander the Great then to occupy and keep the land that Alexander the Great then took so much so that it had to be dispersed among his four generals. And then we see these empires rise, the Seleucid Empire and all of these different things. Then we see a Seleucid named Antichrist Epiphanes who offers the abomination of desolation I've spoke of in Daniel, where he takes a pig, he's a Seleucid king, that comes after Alexander the Great, 
after uh, Seleucia, Seleucius, his general, and he is reigning, and he goes into Jerusalem, and he offers a pig on the altar. This is a historical fact. This isn't debated. You see all of this outlined in Daniel far before it comes to pass. I would say this, and, and many scholars would say that it even outlines the, the coming of Jesus in the year of Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. The buildup from the book of Daniel to the coming of the Messiah. One thing you're going to see um, in this as well, and this is the last point on really the background and just trying to sum up um, this biblical prophecy, fulfilled and unfulfilled, what it does speak of is this eternal kingdom. It's not just talking about coming kings and coming kingdoms. It's also talking about this eternal kingdom that will be established. Which, which leads us to the understanding that there is something beyond Greek kings, Roman kings that would come later. That there is this eternal kingdom that it's speaking of. And so many would take the prophecies of Daniel and, and, and would teach dual prophecy. And I believe that to be the case. That means that one prophecy has two fulfillments. That there's a dual meaning. That there's, there's the prophecy fulfilled in the abomination and desolation and the pig that's offered by Antichrist Epiphanes on the altar. And that there will also be an Antichrist who would come at the end times who would, or a false prophet or someone from the kingdom of darkness that would also create an abomination of desolation in the holy place. Um, so there's these, this concept of dual prophecy. So you can get where if I talked about that, for about you know 40 minutes today, um, I think I would have about five of you sleeping by the end of it. Um, what I want to do is go back into a couple of chapters and just pull out some practical truths. That's always what I try to do in our ministry uh, because we are not trying to figure out um, the end times and exactly how it's going to lay out and understand the intricacies of, of Bible prophecy. We're looking at the practical lessons and applying them to our lives and allowing the Lord to transform us. And so that's just a real quick summation of the rest of Daniel um, in these dual prophecies and in prophecies fulfilled and unfulfilled. So we're going to start in Daniel chapter, two, uh, chapter 9, verse 2. What I also want you to realize is that at this point, Daniel is 90 years old. 90. Okay? Most of us in this room will not live to be 90. That's, you know, that's a, that's a goal. But Daniel is 90 years old. We've tracked him, man, from a teenager in the Babylonian captivity all the way till now, and now in part eight of Children of Babylon. And we've looked at his life as a teen, and now he's 90 years old. Something has happened that we didn't talk about that you'll see in the book of uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, which will be great for you to go back and read. Um, the king Cyrus, which we haven't looked at yet, he comes before Darius. Cyrus has allowed the Jewish people to return to Israel. Some of the Jewish people have returned to Jerusalem. Um, in Nehemiah and Ezra, you're going to see the rebuilding of the temple. They're working with a trowel in their hand, uh, fixing the wall, and they have a sword in the other hand. Um, they are guarding their city while they're rebuilding their walls and they're rebuilding the temple, some type of makeshift temple there. And so we've seen the captivity of, of Israel and then we've seen the, the slow restoration. Now, that doesn't mean that they were given back Jerusalem, they inhabited it, and they were once independent again. No, there were successive, successive kings after um, Cyrus and Darius that kind of went back and forth with the children of Israel. Um, where... Some were allowed to leave, some were kept, there were freedoms given, um, freedoms taken, and you kind of see this back and forth. But Daniel has remained in Jerusalem. I mean, I'm sorry, in Babylon. Um, some, would, some would speculate because he's 90 years old. He's lived his entire life in, in Babylon. He's been opening his window as we looked at last week, looking toward Jerusalem, praying for Jerusalem and, and, and its recovery and its restoration. And the opportunity arises for him to go back, but he's 90 years old. And we're not talking about getting on, you know, a flight and heading back to Jerusalem. We're talking about travel, um, you know, in, in BCE, before the Common Era. Um, we're not talking about, 
you know, cushy travel in a tour bus that's air conditioned. Mm -hmm. And so he is 90 years old and he, is, we find ourselves now in, in chapter nine. There, there, you see all this happening. There's movement. The temple's not completely um, restored to its former grandeur. The city's still being restored. And here is Daniel in Babylon still, chapter 9, verse 2 is where I want to start. And then we're going to just kind of skip around a little bit. In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So, I find it very interesting that Daniel is reading Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was part of the captivity. He is the one who prophesied that Jerusalem would fall, even though the temple authorities and those um, in Jerusalem said it would not fall. He prophesied that it would. He was persecuted for his prophecies because they were not um, pretty, but they were true. And so we have Jeremiah and his scroll being read by Isaiah. So this is interesting that Isaiah's writings are in Babylon. You see in Jeremiah's writings that he addresses those in captivity in Babylon, which is really interesting that these, these Jewish people in captivity in Babylon are reading the scroll of, Isaiah, of Jeremiah. What, a, what an interesting concept. But what he finds when he reads Jeremiah is that Jeremiah prophesies and he understands the prophecy that their captivity in Babylon would be limited to 70 years. Daniel has lasted through all 70 of those years. So then we skip to verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So his response to the word of the Lord is humility, is sackcloth, it's ashes. And I prayed, verse 4, to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercies with those who love Him and with those who keep His commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebel even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. Neither have we heeded Your servants, the prophets, who spoke in Your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people in the land. So we see, let me go ahead and uh, read verse 7. O Lord, righteous belong, righteousness belongs to you, but to a shame of face, as it is this, this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of their unfaithfulness, which they have committed against you. So what's, what is Daniel's response to the word of the Lord, that they would be restored, that the kingdom is going to be restored, that 70 years would pass, and now they're at the end of that 70 years. So I find this really interesting that there is this prophecy that states what's going to happen, yet Daniel still prays. So there's this concept, um, and I'm not going to dive deep into it. Um, we understand that God is sovereign, that God knows all. So under, dissecting this, this conversation um, where God knows what's going to happen, yet He still asks us to pray, and what you're going to find later is He responds to our prayer. Because we pray, pray He acts, in Daniel's case, so reconciling those things to know that God understands the future, that He has even announced it through Jeremiah, and Daniel's response is not to say, God is sovereign, everything will pan out, we're going to be restored to Jerusalem, why pray? Now, it's not just Calvinists who maybe fall into that trap, everybody can fall into that trap. It's not just those who believe in predeterminism that everything is predetermined that would fall into that trap. People like me can easily fall into that trap. Because I know that God is sovereign. I would argue with, with others from different er, um, areas in that understanding. But it doesn't mean that I'm not exempt from that. Because I know that God is sovereign. I know that God knows everything. I know that He understands and knows what's going to happen in the future. And that will happen. 
So we can easily get caught in the middle and trying to reconcile those things and understanding how God works. And my friend, that's a, that's a deep well. It's interesting and it's fun to discuss those things. But this is the reality. God is sovereign and He answers prayer. Do I completely understand how those reconcile? No. I try. <laughs> but there is this beauty that even though He's told Jerusalem's going to be restored... He prays. And it's not just some prayer. Lord, thank you. Jerusalem's going to be restored. I claim your promise. Not some word of faith, mumbo jumbo and nonsense. I claim your promise and I stand on it, Lord. No, he's in sackcloth and ashes. This ain't no joke. He's crying out to God the Father. He's repentant. He's humble at heart. He's not standing pridefully and arrogantly with some promise in his hand like God owes him something. In light of God's sovereignty, he falls on his hands and his knees and sackcloth and his ashes. And he does what? He repents. So my question to you is, when God speaks to your life, when you're reading the scriptures and something jumps off the page at you as it did to, to Daniel, when you're reading Jeremiah... When you're reading Daniel and it jumps off the page and convicts you, what is your response to that? Because we can do one of two things. We can harden our hearts and justify it. That's not really what it means. You know. Or we can respond like Daniel responded. How do you respond to realizing that we've broken the law of God? How do you respond to realizing and seeing Jesus high and lifted up with a crown of thorns on his head and nails in his hands? How do you respond with your sin when you realize what he did for you? It should, it should humble us to the point of sackcloth and ashes. It should humble us to confession. The Lord, I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. The prophet said, I, I repent. When you skip forward, and we realize now, we see, begin to see the prayer as we've read, this humble prayer, this prayer that takes ownership. Dear God, if there's a lesson we need to learn, it's this. <laughs> ownership. Like, it's not my mama's fault. It's not my granddad's fault. Each man will give an account for his own actions before an almighty creator. It's so easy in this world where we blame everything on something, man. A diagnosis? I'm this way because I am diagnosed with this. I'm this way because I have a sickness. And this is a long-standing debate in the addiction and recovery community. It's a sickness. You have the sickness of addiction. Well, I'll say this. You got the sickness of sin. <laughs> But it's not some diagnosis that God can't overcome. That I'm just an addict. That's just the way I'm going to be the rest of my life. And un unfortunately, the world of addiction and recovery perpetuates that concept. That we walk around with our heads down and beat down because of a diagnosis that's been given to us. Instead of standing up and saying, it's not because I was born with addiction. It's because I was born broken. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a man undone, I'm a sinner, and I repent, I take ownership of my actions. We see confession. Now, what I find interesting is that Daniel confesses the sin of Israel. He's, he's a godly man. He's 90 years old. If there's a guy who's godly in the Bible, it's Daniel at 90. If there's a guy who's, who's fought back lust his entire life and overcame to some degree, it's probably Daniel. But he's still repentant at 90 years old. How much, do more, so how much more do some of you young cats need to repent? <laughs> because of the thoughts that go through our wicked minds. Right? Why would we ever get to the place of not owning where we are when a man like Daniel could own his sin at 90 years old? And not say, look at the Israelites, Lord, look at those idiots. and they, they, They've broken your law. They've done this. They've done that. He says, forgive us. We have sinned. He doesn't exclude himself from that. There's ownership. There's confession. There's reverent fear you see here and an honor of God. 
and we see humility. I'm going to read verse 18, jump down to verse 18, because I think it, it's a great prayer to pray. It's one that I love. Um, if I'm in the right place here. Chapter 9, verse 18, it says this. This is the end of his prayer. This whole prayer is beautiful. For time's sake, we couldn't go into all of it today. But man, go back and read that prayer and, and his, you'll hear his heart and his brokenness and all the things we talked about. Let's read verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation. Does God not see their desolation? Does it mean that David, Daniel didn't ask? And the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Man, we should take that scripture and tack it on to the end of all of our prayers. I don't make these supplications because I'm good, because I'm righteous, because I've done um, X, Y, and Z to receive your goodness, because I've built my faith up and up to believe you. But Lord, I just make an appeal to your mercies. I'm not making a supplication because of what I've done or the good or, or, or any formula. I'm making supplications simply because you're merciful and you're kind and you listen. How beautiful is that end of the prayer. So we see that prayer is powerful. We're going to look at that a little bit more in detail and, and dissect the situation here in the end, but let me read a quote to you. It comes from Ian Bounds. This guy is a master when it comes to teaching on prayer. He says this, Prayer breaks all bars, dissolves all chains, opens all prisons, and widens all straits by which God's saints have been held. Prayer breaks all bars, dissolves all chains, opens all prisons, and widens all straits by which God's saints have been held. I'm going to tell you, I was bound in a prison, but my mama, who's suffering from Alzheimer's now and doesn't recognize me much anymore, prayed for me. When I came home at four in the morning off a long acid trip, and the, the hinges of that door stopped creaking. I could hear my mom in the other room, not even knowing that I had arrived. Just praying for me. Save my boy. He's lost and he's dying. God, would you save my boy? My friend, God answers. I didn't want anything to do with him. I rejected that he even existed at one point in my life. But prayer breaks all bars, it dissolves all chains, and opens all prisons, and widens all straits by which God's saints have been held. Let's get forward to chapter 10, verse 5. I know some of you guys have some praying mamas. I don't know what it is about mamas and grandmamas, but I saw some of you get choked up for a second. It's like, oh, grandma, pray it for me. Something about it, right? Because they love you. Because they can put on sackcloth and ashes and cling to God for answers. Because they believe that He'll answer. Mm. And because He is merciful, period. Not because of what we've done. So we see chapter 10, verse 2. We're going to go move on in this text. In those days, this is skipping to another situation. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. This is another situation. He's fasting. He's mourning. Verse 3. I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. Till three weeks, three whole weeks were fulfilled. This is the, where they get the 21-day fast. Um, concept. This is a real fast, by the way. This isn't just a kosher diet employed like we saw in the beginning of Daniel when they tried to change his diet. What modern Christianity has done is made this weird vegan fast that then attaches a 21-day concept to it at the end. Um, he was eating kosher in the beginning, and now this is a different type of fast. We looked at extreme fast, common fast in the beginning. Now he is in this, this common fast where he is giving up food. And he's mourning before God. 
Verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of the multitude. Now, I believe this is the pre-incarnate Christ. Um, some would argue that, that's fine. It's not worth arguing. Um, it looks a lot like Jesus from the book of Revelations. Eyes of fire. This, this, it's not announcing him like it will in a minute. It, it announces the angels and their names. It's, not a, it's just saying this guy looks like a man. He's wearing linen. Um, the pre-incarnate. Now, incarnate means incar the incarnation is when God becomes man. That's when he's born in the, the womb of Mary. That's the incarnation. So to be pre-incarnate is to, for pre-birth. Before before um, Mary gives birth to him, because Jesus isn't just appear on the scene then, he has always been. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Before Abraham was, he said, I am. So, I believe this is him. Whether you do or not, I don't think it's, it's worth arguing over. But it is not an angel, or it doesn't appear to be to me, because it announces what those look like in a minute. But we're seeing this interaction now. We're seeing that he's praying, he's fasting, he's humbling himself before God. We see this encounter with someone who looks like Jesus in the book of Revelation. And then we're going to skip to verse 10. Suddenly, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees in the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking the word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart, your God, to your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. <laughs> Talked about getting a little bit more in depth of this concept that did God come because of His sovereignty? Yes. Sure. But that's not what it says here. It says God came because of His words. That your words can cause God to react. That prayers, for, for what other reason do we pray? Yes, it, it, it humbles us and brings us to submission ultimately to His will. I understand that concept. Here, Jerusalem's going to be restored. Seventy years prophesied. It's going to come to pass. He still prays. He still clings to God. Like what He says matters. Like God actually hears His prayers and responds to His prayers. Why does it say He responded? In this passage, it says, because Daniel Asked. Now, was Daniel asking to be prospered and to, to be blessed and multiplied a thousand times when he sowed his $10 seed that it would become a thousand dollar seed? Um, <laughs> no. Have you not heard the entire conversation about Daniel broken and humble and realizing his insufficiency in and of himself to do anything good that he's, he's, cons he's uh, approaching God's mercies and his grace is not what he's achieved? This is his humble posture in prayer. There's a balance in prayer. And unfortunately, it can get misconstrued and taken to extremes with the whole word of faith doctrine and nonsense. But there's also a balance in the middle that tells me when I read scriptures like this that there's spiritual warfare going on, which we'll see a little bit deeper into in a second, and that we have a part in that. You're not just bystanders. This is war. This is life and this is death. What we do matters. What we say matters. What we pray matters. So we see this encounter. Now let's read further on there. Then he said to me, do not fear Daniel. I'm going to read that again. From the first day 
that you set your heart. Now, highlight that from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble. Underline, <laughs> humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard from the moment. How many of us have gotten to the place where we said, man, I've been, I've been praying for this. And God hasn't come through. I've been praying for a whole two days, man. My family's still not restored. <laughs> right? I mean, forget two days. How about a year? I mean, really though, like, this guy's 90 years old. He's watched Jerusalem be sacked, be pillaged, be mocked. As he sits in the isolation of Babylon away from his home country, and he's still faithful, he's still calling out to God even though there has been delays. He is persevering from the moment. Let me tell you this, guys. From the moment you humble your hearts before your God, from the moment you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself, to know Him, He hears you. My friend, He knows you through and through. I heard a preacher on the radio one time, and I don't know who he is, who he is so I can't give him credit. I can't remember. But he, he said this, The devil can't stop God from responding to believing prayer, but he can stop you from asking. The devil can't stop God from responding to believing prayer, but he can stop you from asking. From unbelief, lack of faith, from lack of trust, he can stop you from asking. Because you feel like he's not going to hear you. So my friends, set your face toward him. Humble your heart and call out to God because he hears you. And when he delays, call out the evermore. Like the persistent widow, knock on the door again. Say, God, I'm still here. I'm still broken. My mind is still ravaged from addiction. Relationships are still broken. God, I need you. Knock, seek, and ask. Daniel had understood this at the age of 90 years old. He understood perseverance. Let's read on, verse 13. But the prince, this is where you get a little insight into how prayer works and the warfare that happens when we pray. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, we're talking about uh, the pre-incarnate Christ or an angelic being or something that's not of this world. And now he's talking about the prince of Persia holding him back. So who is this prince of Persia? Well, it would appear that there's not only um, agents of good in the spiritual realms, but there's agents of darkness. The Apostle Paul, I believe, from this context, is then quoting later that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual hosts of wickedness in dark places, that he then engages in this context that we, there's a war happening, a waging between light and dark that we see in the book of Daniel. This prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. 21 days? There's this battle? But God is sovereign. But there's this battle. But God is sovereign. But He answered the prayer of Daniel. But God is sovereign. All of it is true. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes. Now we're introduced to Michael, the archangel again. He came to help. He got some backup. Michael's got his back. <laughs> and there's a war, there's a wrestling in the spiritual realm that is enacted by Daniel. By believing prayer, by humble prayer. Because your prayer matters. It moves things. It changes things. He responds to Daniel. It says it in black and white. Because you asked. So, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now we're plural kings of Persia. Spiritual hosts of darkness and 
principalities and powers, as Paul said. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. So, we have the revelation of the reality and the reading of the text of Jeremiah. We have prayer that calls out to God with ownership, with confession, with reverent fear, with humility, with brokenness. We have fasting and humility on Daniel's part. We have an encounter with what looks like the pre-incarnate Christ. We have this insight into this spiritual wrestling that's happened and the perseverance of Daniel that, surprise, surprise, he's praying for these three weeks. How long was this angel or pre-incarnate Christ being held back in the kingdom of Persia by the prince of Persia? 21 days. Did it have anything to do with Daniel's prayer? It sure appears to. Or else why even mention it? My friend... There is wrestling. There is warfare. And right now, on this property, there are angels. Right now, on this property, there are spirits that some of you guys are dealing with. Now, I'm not talking some kooky, spiritual, weird, supernatural stuff. I'm reading the text. And if it's not enough in the Old Testament, then read Paul. Spiritual hosts of wickedness principalities and powers, a hierarchy of evil that has been set out to dismantle your lives. Will you sit by some observer? Or will you humble yourself and pray? Will you, will you realize that what you say matters, that prayer matters, and fall on your hands and knees and cry out, to God. There is a wrestling that happens. I've seen it time and time again at Teen Challenge, and I've seen it throughout the world. You know, we went on a, a, um, a Word on the Street segment in, in Las Vegas. I had never been to Las Vegas. I've frequented many crack houses. Um, I've done some terrible things in my life. I've been a horrible person. I've, I've been witness to some darkness, and I know you have too. But there was something, man. When we went there as Christians to Las Vegas, me, Jesse... Uh, Jesse and Wesley and I, dude, we just wanted to get back to our Airbnb the whole time. <laughs> like, get me out of this heavy, dark, sinful environment. Like, I can't tell you. I, like, I'm not even going to repeat the things that we saw. Just walking the street. Some of you have been there. You know what I'm talking about. Billboards that just go back and forth all day that can give you a, a transvestite little person in your room um, in, in about an hour. Or a... You name it, you got it. It's there. It's the city of sin, temptation, debauchery. I can remember us just like, dude, let's get these interviews done with, over with. I do not want to be out here an hour longer. The oppression. There's a time in my life where I would have embraced that. Um, but when you're living for Christ, and then you feel that darkness weighed down on you like a heavy weight, now it's not just in Las Vegas. It can be in any city in the United States. But it's not just regional. And that's what it's claiming, some kind of regional concept here of darkness. It even says that, you know, speaking of Michael, but your prince came. What is it? Why is he saying your prince? Why is Michael Daniel's prince? If they're a prince of palities and powers and darkness, then it would appear that they're, and it's announcing Dan, uh, Michael as a prince, that, that many of... Uh, associated Michael as being the prince of Israel, of Jerusalem. There are these battles that are regional, that it sure would appear that this, this angelic being or the pre-incarnate Christ is being held back from. Now, let's bring it down to home. And let me end with this. You know, here at Teen Challenge, I, um, I've, been, I've worked here quite a while now, and I've been through it myself, and I'm not saying this to demean anyone, but I see a bunch of different faces, but we deal with the same spirits. Same faces, different spirits. Individuals now that are sitting in this chair that remind me of other individuals in this program. I'm just a man, and I'm just observing here based upon contexts like this. But I see guys with different names, different faces, same attitudes. 
Same anger. Same prison mentality of manipulation. Same perverted, lustful spirit. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That I'm not wrestling against you. That Teen Challenge isn't wrestling against you. That there are supernatural powers that we are engaging in, that we are being susceptible to, that we are falling prey to, that there's a spiritual battle that's waging. And when we can come to that understanding and realize that this has been set to dismantle my life, that this, this, this magazine cover that makes my eyes turn because a woman's breasts are halfway out, that makes me gaze and drool, that I'm engaging in lust. And lust isn't just a word. It's a sin and it's attached to darkness. And it ignites something in our hearts. It feeds something. And we engage in this spirit of darkness. You get what I'm saying? You're not the enemy. I'm not the enemy. There's an enemy that is beyond this world. And when we're so focused on one another, you know that guy that in your dorm that just drives you crazy? He's not your enemy. The guy who talks too much, he's not your enemy. And when we can get outside of that and realize that there is a supernatural battle waging, and we can look at that brother who annoys the mess out of us, And we can say, God, save his life. Lord, uh, we put on sackcloth and ashes and we we repent. And we repent together, not look at this idiot, but Lord, forgive us because we're all sinful. Change his life. You're wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities' powers. Then we have breakthrough. The breakthrough in prayer. He he perseveres for, for these three weeks and... And the answer comes through this breakthrough of prayer. I'm going to read the lyrics to a song in closing as we sum up this entire book of Daniel and the life of Daniel, looking at a young man who entered Babylon in chains and left the second in charge under Darius. We look at a man who at the age of 90 years old was aged and still humble and still broken and still calling out to God who realized what the real issues were, that it wasn't flesh and blood, that it was supernatural. So song lyrics go something like this from... There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find Oh, I love the flowers and the trees and the smell of the grinding seed and all the beautiful things here in life. Nobody's ever quite ready, but they all take the ride. Many have died with, for the promise inside. They never got to see it in their time. I, I'm a pilgrim here on this side of the great divide. I'm a pilgrim here, but I'll walk here And I'll add this word, in Babylon for a while. Let's bow our heads. God, we love you and we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we are in Babylon, but let us not be of it. Lord, would you help us to be the persistent prayer warriors that Daniel was? We confess our weakness. We confess, Lord, our sin as as a body. Lord, I don't isolate myself. Lord, we are sinners. We are broken We always wander and waver and bend away from your will. But God, would you constantly pull us back as we repent and humble ourselves before you? Lord, we want to wage war right now and announce that this is not flesh and blood, that there are real battles waging here that are supernatural in men's lives. Battles for men's sanity. Battles over lust. Battles over bondage. God, it is nothing we're going to find in the book unless that book is the gospel. But it is something that's going to be found at your feet through the breaking of bonds and bands in our lives by you, by the power of the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out, to transform us. 
Lord, not so that we can just sit by and sit on some back row of some church, but that we can recognize that there's a spiritual battle waging and we wouldn't be sitting home like some illegitimate father who is not engaged in anything. But Lord, as active participants in supernatural battle because it is not waged by our intellect. It is not waged by our understanding. It is waged by the Spirit and the power of the living God that breaks the bonds of of bondage in our lives. Lord, I pray for those brothers right now that are held by the straits of the enemy, whose minds are bound up. In the name of Jesus, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, over their lives. The Lord rebuke you. Lord, we pray freedom. Lord, we pray for discernment, Lord, as we walk this life in Babylon and we see the wars waging around us, may us understand what's really happening and not be so offended by people, but be offended by the spirit of Babylon and and wage war against it. God, break the bonds in this place because this isn't just some get better quick program. God, this is life transformation, liberation from the inside out. Men who will die, Jesus, if we don't find you. Men who will die if the power of darkness is not broken over our lives. God, would you do a work in us and through us? Would you raise up men of God, prayer warriors, Jesus, who change the world in which we live, even though it is dark and dismal and bleak. Lord, let us walk as pilgrims here for a while. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. God bless you guys. Go in the Spirit of the Lord and take this whole series with you, man. Put it in your pocket. God bless you.